Uh, we have uh, Ross Miriam, who we watched earlier today, playing Death Shadow. And he's playing against Paulo Vitor Damodorosa, the Hall of Famer, who's also playing Death Shadow. And of course, uh, Paulo part of the team that really broke this version of Death Shadow in Legacy at Pro Tour 25th anniversary. Uh, as you're looking at the deck list, what, what, what changes are you seeing that this, these guys have made from that uh, breakthrough deck at the Pro Tour? Uh, the main the main change main deck is the presence of Dismember over uh, Snuff Out. Uh, both players probably recognizing that Death Shadow Mirrors might be popular, and Dismember is a much better card in that mirror match than Snuff Out would be. Um, post board, uh, uh, Miriam well Ross Miriam is playing a much more traditional sideboard. We're trying to attack on a number of different angles. The the most interesting card is Winter Orb. But uh, Paolo has access to one more Liliana, the Last Hope, a key card in these uh, black matchups. Yeah. Card we, we just saw just absolutely take over the Grixis, uh, mirror, Grixis control mirror match. All right, so Paolo Vitor Damodorosa leads things off with a Street Wraith and a Ponder, while Ross Merriam has a Death Shadow cycle of his own at the end of Paolo's turn. He's going to crack a Marsh Flats. Yeah, and, and when you're facing Death Shadow, the order in which a player might crack a fetch land or cycle a Street Wraith is very important information. Um, normally, if they're going Street Wraith first, they, they do want to draw a land, while if they had fetch first, you know that there's probably at least two lands in their hand. So that sequence actually does give information on um, Ross, Ross's hand, and Paolo will definitely be paying attention to that. All right, so Delver of Secrets resolves for Ross Merriam. Apollo had the option of dazing it, but chose uh, chose not to. And he's got a Delver all his own. Yeah, I think uh, Paolo had a fatal push in hand. So, uh, Del 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 oh, it's no, a death it's shadow. No, it's a death shadow. I'm sorry, yeah. So, actually, then it's interesting, but you can't... Putting yourself behind on mana can actually be really detrimental in matches like this. And if Paolo had access to that Delver of Secrets, you know, you can always end up blocking and trading. But because Paolo decided not to trade, um, this might be a question of life toll management. Both players have to be really cautious about putting the other player below 13, since that's when Death Shadow is castable. So there's kind of a... It's kind of watching two Blade Masters at play, right? Like, when do you actually want to strike? Because if you strike too early, then, well, you're in trouble, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> from a gigantic Death Shadow. So here we see a Stubborn Denial from Paolo Vitor Damodorosa. He goes to 12, by the way. That's, as you mentioned, an important life total. Yeah, very important life total. And what matters here as well is that Ross did not play uh, second land. So Paolo feels that there's a chance that Ross just doesn't have that second land. But it turned out Ross has both Wasteland and Underground Sea in hand. Um, so Ross is OK with uh, this exchange. Okay, and he wastelands one of the watery graves and passes the turn back to Paolo. Yeah, Paolo's going to brainstorm on upkeep. Finally enough, Delver uh, would have transformed. But yeah, here the brainstorm on upkeep is purely to make the Delver of Secrets become insectile aberration. And Paolo, it's a play that l makes you lose value because by default you're brainstorming on upkeep, which means that you are one mana down for that turn. You are also redrawing a card, so the Brainstorm is pretty much automatically going to be a little worse. So when that play happens, you are valuing that I need Insectile Aberration to happen. I need to guarantee that it occurs. Reveals another Brainstorm. He's going to draw that card. Now it looks like he's got a Polluted Delta in hand. Gets in for three in the air, drops Ross to 12. Now Ross can deploy his Death Shadows. I, f I think looking at kind of Paolo's hand, uh, Paolo does have a lot of interaction between that Force of Will and that Daze, um, as well as being able to cast a Death Shadow. So it's one of the hardest things in this mirror match is trying to figure out, am I the person who's going to be aggressive this match, or am I the person that's trying to outgrind value and then eventually have a board that leaves my opponent in a situation where they cannot win? And Paolo has counter magic. And counter magic in these tempo decks usually is better at pushing advantage rather than fixing an existing problem. 
So Paolo probably is going to go for a more aggressive line here with the viewpoint that Counter Magic will just push through a victory uh, rather than trying to grind out a long game. Um, essentially in this spot, I think Paolo feels ahead and wants to stay ahead and just doesn't want to give Ross time. All right, so Ross is going to transform his Insectile Aberration with a Brainstorm. He's also got a Fatal Push in hand. Mm. Right, and the time you know that Fatal Push is going to be critical um, to how this game plays out. Essentially, Paolo is probably going to have to force the Fatal Push, but yeah. <laughs> Brainstorm gets dazed. That was a good bait. Um, yeah, he says, okay, what do you got after that? Yeah, and now Paolo has to decide, do, do I force here? Because if Paolo forces, that, that's all the resources gone. And you basically have to believe that your current board state is going to be good enough to get the, the job done. Um, it's and, actually... And he's know, behind in the race in you know, terms of the, the two. You know, Paolo's down to nine. He's three hits away from the Insectile Aberration. Yeah. It was really interesting for me here that Ross decided to leave with Brainstorm without having that additional mana. Probably trying to bait out a daze because... But fundamentally, Ross could have just played a land and played push, and then days would still not work. So it's actually a really close call here. And he is going to go to eight. Makes his death shadow a little bigger. Pitches brainstorm. Has one card left in hand. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, force of will giving plus one plus one is a pretty <laughs> ludicrous interaction. <laughs> it's force of will plus aggressive urge, <laughs> uh, except permanent. I guess yeah. Balgro, I can't remember. There was a card from. Um, original Mirrodin that did that put a plus one plus one counter yeah, the yeah. creature <laughs> yeah Paolo here considering uh, the thing with uh, a watery grave here it does make the death shadow 7-7 seven, seven, but that doesn't fundamentally change the clock right away and Ross could attack with uh, insectile aberration twice so it's actually a really close call as to whether or not to pay two life here since this death shadow might be enough but I uh, yeah uh, okay he's gonna dismember well that, that that would be lethal damage if Ross has nothing Sends in the team, and that is lethal damage for Paulo Vitor Damodorosa. Gets himself uh, a pretty hefty death shadow. Yeah. I think Paulo was hesitating just to figure out how could I lose rather than anything else, and figured, well, I'm probably fine. <laughs> but if uh, Ross had a force of will there, the life would have been paid. But then Ross is forced to, to block, so there's still a gigantic death shadow in play, and Ross would still have to have some an answer to that as well. So Paolo probably figured, well, I can win right away, but if it doesn't work out, I'm probably still really far ahead. All right. Street Wraith is the play for the Pro Tour Hall of Famer. Here, uh, a grand favorite. Ooh, and he's going to reanimate that Street Wraith here on turn one. Going to drop himself to, uh, I mean, he's basically in turn two Death Shadow territory here. Yeah, yeah and reanimate in this matchup, exceptional. Um, All right, there's Diabolic Edict. That looks like it's going to get dazed. It is. Is it going to get dazed back? No. And and there just aren't that many clean answers to Street Wraith. The five mana, being a five mana card means Fatal Push doesn't work. Dismember is kind of the, the cleanest answer. Uh, I'll, Diabolic Edict costing two is a drawback. Here. <laughs> Paolo reorders. <laughs> there's Delver Secrets. Old habits die hard, Paolo. I mean, yeah, if you play control, then the most important part are your lands, right? So, <laughs> But when you're being aggressive like that, let's get those creatures in front. All right. Brainstorm is the play from Ross Merriam. Yeah, and, and here Ross is relatively far behind, but Ross has time. And also, if Ross has access to the card Death Shadow, and I believe there's two, then uh, the wrong attack from Paolo could put Ross at a life toll, where Ross can simply go, well, I'll just drop both of these and now you can't really attack because you would be in a lot of trouble. So even going to, like, say, 12 or 11, Ross basically is telling Paolo, well, your Street Wraith can't attack anymore because the, the race would be massively in Ross's favor. So it would give Ross a lot of breathing room because he has specifically two. One could be answered pretty reliably by something like a Fatal Push or Dismember, but two? Two is very hard to, to answer. The most time we've seen consumed in gameplay and everything we watch is which two cards am I putting back from Brainstorm? Uh, there's a fatal push on the Delver. 
So, just has to find an answer for that street wraith. Just. <laughs> just. <laughs> Uh, the fact that they're playing Dismember rather than Snuff Out really gives them that chance, though. Like, the, the version at the Pro Tour, d I do not believe, played Dismember. Um, and that puts you at a, quite a disadvantage against a card like Street Wraith. Um, here, both players do have an answer, but Ross can only take so much time uh, trying to find it. Um, this turn, the attack from Street Wraith would put Ross to 12, which is perfect territory for some Death Shadows to come in. And then it puts uh, Paolo in a difficult position, whether to attack or not. Um, it pretty, pretty much puts the game in a relative stall until Paolo can find an answer for the Death Shadows, and once Paolo does, Paolo will resume attacking. <laughs> All right. Paolo plays a very literal ponder. Yeah, very literal. But I found it interesting as well that Paolo has a Street Wraith in hand and um, decided not to cycle it, so Paolo's looking probably for something relatively specific um, since you normally would want to cycle something like a Street Wraith to have information on what you would want from the Ponder. Um, so it's interesting that Paolo's keeping the, the Street Wraith in hand here. All right, so Wasteland is going to take down an Underground Sea. And uh, it's important to note Ross is going to really need a land here. Without a land... Uh, well, there's yeah. a Death Shadow, 1-1. One, one. But hoping to get bigger. Oh my. Paolo has a second Wasteland in hand that I spotted from last turn. This is gonna this is gonna be a huge, huge edge for Paolo. Um, he has to decide though, because it's a second mana source, but I think putting Ross from one to zero mana is more important than trying to get a diabolic like Dedic through. And this dismember is good enough. <laughs> and the dismember. Wow. It's gonna look like a fast 2 0 here for Paolo Vita Domodorosa in this mirror match. I mean, this is, yeah, it, it's very likely. There's a four turn clock. So, so Ross does have time to draw land, but um, once the Death Shadow player is at some a nine or less life, attacks from an unblockable free force start mattering very heavily. And a lot of the cards, like Street Wraith, are just accelerating your opponent's clock. Um, so it's quite dangerous here. But a land with that second Death Shadow might have given Ross a chance if it wasn't for Paolo's potential chance to just play a Diabolic Edict on it, plus Paolo has Force of Will backup. Yeah, and Thoughtseize, and... Just in full control here. Yeah, that, that Street Wraith just going to town. Just del deals the whole... Well, not the whole damage. I guess Ross helped a little bit, but... Fundamentally, that card is so good in the mirror match, if you ever get to cast it, just because unblockable, extremely hard to kill, and uh, it just gets, yeah, it just gets the job done. So Thoughtseize is the play from Paolo. He's like, okay, what could happen here? What could go wrong if you draw land? Right. And again, this is straight up blue-black Death Shadow. This isn't Grix the Grixis Death Shadows you might have seen before the Pro Tour that had Lightning Bolt. So Thoughtseize is a pretty safe play here. Uh, yeah. So we see a Ratchet Bomb. That's see some, another Death Shadow. That's some hot tech with Liliana's defeat. That's a good Liliana's way to do it. Liliana's defeat, yeah. yeah. I, I definitely agree with Paulo's decision to take it. That that would be how the game could go wrong. And that's the hand. Paulo Vito Domitorosa. Two quick games here in the Death Shadow Mirror. He goes up to 5-0. and oh. Again, member of Team Channel Fireball, team that really kind of pioneered this deck at the Pro Tour and uh, certainly has probably more experience with it than anybody else in the room other than his teammates from the Pro Tour. Yeah, and, and Paolo's used to playing these like aggro tempo decks, so it's perfectly in his suited to his style of play. Um, I thought he played those games really well overall. I mean, obviously. <laughs> not going <laughs> to pass judgment here. Uh, no, Pop. Yeah. We do have more time walk action for you. I can tell you uh, a legacy stalwart, Joe, Joe Lissette, playing in the feature match area. Uh, he's on Stoneblade, and he's up against Julian John, who's playing Reanimator. So uh, what, what's the... What do you think? I mean, Swords to Plowshare seems like a, a big uh, advantage in in the uh, Reanimator match. Is that the case? Am I being naive? Um, I think Swords to Plowshares is okay. Um, it's worth noting that it does answer most of the alternative reanimation spells, but it does. It, the fact is, Gristlebrand will still draw seven cards, and. If uh, Julian did it, reanimated that Gristle Brand with an Animate Dead or an Exhume rather than a Reanimate, it will draw 14, you gain back 7, and then next turn you unleash everything and probably win. 
So the issue with uh, source of plowshares is it's often a little too late. So really what uh, Joel said wants to do is, especially in the post-board games, is there's free copies of Surgical Extraction. We want those with the four Snapcaster Mages, and that's the post-board plan. So game one probably favors Julian extremely heavily, and then uh, games two and three uh, should favor Joe, just because Surgical is, is kind of key in, in this type of matchup. So Faithless Looting pitches Dark Ritual and Exhume now casts Unmask, targeting Joe. You see True Name Nemesis, Sword Supply Shares, a uh, Venser, Shaper Savant, four lands, one of which is a Caracas. Yeah, and keynote, the card you would want to take the most here is that Caracas. So it's <laughs> a, yeah, I mean, Swords of Plowshares, um, the difference between Caracas and Swords here is that Swords allows Julian to gain life and continue being able to cast Reanimates and come back. Caracas is just repeat a repeated way to get rid of the card, and uh, it's not, and Julian cannot regain the life. So not being able to attack makes this Caracas a really key card and might force Julian to go for something else than a... Uh, a Gristlebrand here. Um, ultimately, Julian is probably going to look to get an Ashen Rider in play at some point, uh, which is tech in this list. Get rid of that Caracas and, and go ahead. But Julian, apart from that Caracas, is very happy to see Joe's hand. It's extremely weak in terms of time. Julian has a lot of time here. All right. So Joe is set. Just plays the waiting game here. Doesn't really have that much. It looks like he drew a Council's Judgment. He did. Um, one interesting thing is Julian decided to pitch that in Tomb earlier. I was a little surprised by that. I was going to ask you. Yeah, and it, that might have been um, an error in Judgment here. Just because without any other way to put a creature into the graveyard, pitching the one card that allows your com your deck to function might have been... Um, Maybe, maybe uh, not the most optimal line. And here you see Julian having to flashback Faithless Looting. And, and now the problem is you're on Joe's hand was pretty slow. And now you're unlocking Joe's potential to hit that Venser. Although, oh. again, damage could be done. Venser can buy some time. Well, he does end up getting to pitch a Chancellor of the Annex and a Gristlebrand here. Yeah. Also, Joe did draw a Force of Will, which is going to be key. Venser, Venser bouncing the spell is not going to do much. Venser bouncing the creature is okay. But the key part is playing Force of Will on that on one of those uh, reanimation spells. I think Julian has access to multiple reanimation spells, though. So probably the, the easiest, easiest way to beat these blue decks uh, game one is a combination of Unmask or just the fact that all your reanimation spells, well, you have a ton and they cost one or two mana. So it's very easy to, to jam through and eventually get something to stick. And you that's, see, yeah. just Joe Lissette right here is... Uh, when Julian drew his card for the turn, he kind of like knocked one card off. And I guess Joe's just trying to make sure that the card he drew was the top card and not the... Not the knocked off card. Double checking. You see them talking to a judge about it, doing a little bit of reenactment. Uh, yeah, thankfully in this situation, one of the most important attributes is I do not believe that um, there's any effect, like draw effect that affected the top of the library. So it shouldn't matter which card. Right, mean, it's not like a brainstorm situation. Right, right. So, so I mean, it does matter in terms of, I guess, overall integrity, making sure you draw the right card. But had Julian drawn the, the second card, it would not. So, assuming both cards are just unknown, it does not really matter which is which. Yeah, it should be okay. But, but I appreciate that Joe is just checking to be sure here. Um, you know, fundamentally, you, I, I guess you want to just play the game as well as you can. See Julian dividing up his graveyard into targets and non-targets. <laughs> the, these are the cards I no longer care about. These are the cards that are going to be big problems for you. <laughs> but yeah. Here it's a good question as to which spell Julian goes for first. Um, the so going for something like Exhume or Animate Dead has the advantage that Julian would stay at a very healthy life total. So Julian would be able to draw up to fourteen cards of Gristlebrand, might split it seven and then try to reanimate later for seven. Um, reanimate is cheaper though, so and Julian knows that there's a Venser in front. Uh, so basically going for you know for 
a reanimate there means that you, you're ignoring Venser. Julian does not know about the Force of Will, which is a really important uh, part of this process. And it's also why sometimes you don't want to unmask right away, is because, I mean, Julian probably did not know what Joe was on, so that's why you saw the unmask right away, but in a matchup like this, that's why you sometimes want to keep unmasked. So ultimately, you see that they just made Julian shuffle his deck. As for the target, in case you were doubting, big demons. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right, so it looks like reanimate's going to be... Oh. Reanimate's going to be the first option here. Going to go reanimate, targeting Gristlebrand. I think reanimate makes sense when you know your opponent has Venser, since it's the best way to play around it. Um, here, this would put Julian to 11, and then you could Venser the Gristlebrand end of turn. So if Julian decided to draw cards, uh, Julian would go to 4, and then an attack with Venser would put Julian to 2. And with Joe presenting lethal next turn. So I actually kind as weird as it sounds, I kind of like letting the reanimate on Gristlebrand resolve, resolve uh, letting Julian go to 11, and then venturing it back. The problem, unfortunately, with this line is that Julian draws their cards right away and could use them right away with potential more reanimation spells. So I think it's probably a little too ambitious to try to, to win against Julian this way. Um, I guess that ultimately means that probably forcing is the way to go. He's got a Vendillion click here. Yeah, and, and this gives Joe some information as to whether he he wants to let this Crystal Brand come into play or not. Um, this hand is chock full of reanimation spells, so forcing the reanimate is probably not going to work. But the problem is, by letting that reanimate resolve, there's still an exhume, there's still an animate dead, so Julian will be able to cast one of these other spells this turn, and that might be problematic. So here, if you believe Julian is most likely going to draw seven. So I don't believe Julian made a land drop this turn since we Faithless Looting last turn. So right. right. So we're drawing seven. We don't want a fetch land because a fetch land would put us to free against a Vendillion Clique, which is no good. So probably Julian will draw into a land of some sort, a swamp or badlands or something. Um, if Julian draws it to Faithless Looting, that reanimates a second card, and that second card would be quite good. But yeah, here Joe is going for the aggressive plan. You lose eight life. If you want to draw cards, be my guest. Okay, so Gristlebrand comes into play. Eight life. Draw seven. It should be eight. I, I believe reanimate is converted mana cost, yes. so it should be eight, yes. Yeah, yeah. There we go. You had the right life total. Ultimately, he goes to four. Now, the question is, can he find something to get that Venser out of Joe's hand? Well, it's not, it's not just getting the Venser out, because Caracas kind of does a very good impression sure. there. But yeah, the, it's, it's about finding Unmask, it's about disrupting Joe's plan, and then it's about reanimating that Chancellor of the NX. Since Chancellor doesn't uh, fold to the card Caracas, it's not a legendary creature. Um, yeah. I, Caracas is really hard for the reanimator deck to beat just because it's really hard to attack in and deal damage as a result. With Julian at four, uh, Julian really needs to deal gain life at some point. Otherwise, that Trinium Nemesis that may not be the best card overall in a matchup like this could just finish the game by a single swing. So Unmask, Pitching, Animate Dead, Seize Venser, Force of Will, True Name Nemesis, and Council's Judgment. And, and here there's no card you specifically want to protect with Force, um, so it's okay to let the, the hand get revealed. I guess if you wanted to uh, protect the Venser and give yourself a chance against that Chancellor of the NX, then you could afford pitching True Name Nemesis. But I think this is okay too. Um, having access to both True Name and Venser is kind of nice. Also, the combo between Venser and Caracas is something else if you get into the long game. Oh, wow. Yeah, just. I mean, it's expensive, but it's as close to. I guess you could actually play the card cap size in this format. <laughs> <laughs> But, it, I mean, it, it, it also bounces spells, so it's a plus. But, yeah. Here All right, he is going to take the Force of Will. 
It, it's the cheapest. It's well, it's a free spell. So it's you when, when you the hand is full of clunky cards like that. You know, Council's Judgment, Fencer, True Name Nemesis. You want to take the least clunky card, which is the Force of Will. It's worth noting that Council's Judgment can't even be played with the four basic islands. Right. Yeah, Joe is going to need a second white source to cast that. But, you know, Julian's not done with his turn yet. No. Still got a ton yeah. of cards in hand. Right, and, and that's the risk you take by, by going for this aggressive line of letting Julian lose essentially 15 life. Um, is that Julian will draw a ton of action, and you're going to have to suffer through that and hope that you can do those two attacks and deal lethal damage. Um, that Marsh Flats play was a little strange. I probably would have just played the Faithful Suiting first before playing a land. Since with your opponent having Vendillion Cleek in play, there's a very high chance that you're not going to be able to crack that Marsh Flat just because a free one flyer will get there. Because as, as the game stands now, if Julian decided to crack the fetch land, animate dead, uh, the Chancellor of the Annex, then it's a very easy bounce with Caracas, bounce with Venser, attack for free. Um, so you could get the Tyrant, but without a free spell, such as Lotus Petal, or essentially, also Julian could have pitched Corral Therapy. I think that would have been like a really interesting play. Oh, yeah. Right. If Julian put a Cabal Therapy in the graveyard with Tide Sprout Tyrant, Julian could have essentially sacrificed the Gristlebrand knowing it goes away because of Caracas and uh, bounced something with, tithe, with the Tyrant's ability. And then the Tyrant's in play. And once the Tyrant's in play, I think Julian can take control. So I, th that would have been the line. Pitch Cabal Therapy, sacrifice Gristlebrand to Cabal Therapy. Uh, once you animate dead the Tide Sprout Tyrant, and then you win from that position. Uh, he's going to three here. Now, now Joe could have obviously bounced the Crystal Brand response, so it's kind of close um, in that sense. So, so it, it maybe wasn't the the best line, but you still lose to a Lotus Petal, so it's yeah. All right, so he's going to exhume his Tide Spout Tire. He's going to cast Exhume, and then when it resolves. Yeah, with Exhume, you don't need to choose right away, but yeah, we know what's going on here. But as you said, this, is this it. should be lethal. Yeah, without a spell to bounce anything. Playland, Venser, bounce yeah. Tyrant, attack for free. So, yeah. <laughs> Up comes the Tyrant, in comes Vendillion Click, and Joe Lissette takes game one in somewhat unlikely fashion. It looked like he was... Uh, really up against it, but uh, Gristlebrand did a lot of the work for him. Yeah, exactly. And, and Joe took a really risky line there, but decided this is probably going to be my, my best chance. Um, they're, they're re it, it's really, and from Julian's side, it was really hard. Do I start with Reanimate? Do I start with Animate Dead? Like, which one do I actually go for, knowing that my opponent likely has interaction? But because Julian went for the Reanimate, that incentivized Joe to not cast Force of Will and to just be patient and wait. And yeah, you saw the result. I, I like though that Joe played the Vendillion Cleek. Know what's up and then force right. after, not force after that. All right, here comes Faithless Looting on turn one for Julian. And, and I don't want to understate this enough. I think Joe was very unfavored game one. So like getting that game one win is really big, especially post board once you have access to surgicals and. So you, uh, you think game two is just swings much more in his favor with. Surgical Extraction? Yes, just that zero mana interaction plus the ability to get it back with Snapcaster gives you a lot. And, and, and it works as a super, kind of super counter spell. It's basically Force of Will in a matchup like this. Not as good against something like Exhume, right, which is not targeted. Right. Uh, Exhume is really good against Surgical Extraction because, again, it doesn't target, so you get to choose. Um, that said, Joe should have access to other cards. Uh, he actually has access to two spell snares, which is a very clean answer to, to exhume free fluster storms and never spell snare in the sideboard. So I and two containment priests. So I think that Joe is fundamentally well covered wow. against the card exhume to start with. Okay, here we're gonna see an unmask. He's gonna pitch an exhume to unmask Joe. Yeah, and Joe has a surgical extraction. This is another way to beat surgical extraction. You unmask first. 
um, and then you can take the surgical. And your opponent, if you have two creatures, your opponent could respond, right? They could surgical extraction, like the creature they'd least like to see in play. Truth of the matter, um, that allows the other one to come around. Joe yeah. is trying to decide if he wants to respond. It looks like he is going to maybe surgical the Gristle brand here. Yeah. Or is Iona worse? I'm not even sure. Um, I think... If you want an analysis here, I think Iona is okay for Joe. Iona is very bad against the card Caracas if Joe gets one of the two copies. Um, and also, Joe has answers in every in the two colors. You can either play blue cards like Jay's Fencer, or you can play white cards like Council's Judgment and Swords of Plowshares. So, whichever color you name, the other one can come through. Uh, the blue cards are a little slower, but you get to, to have a lot of card draw and hopefully get to, like, a Caracas. And the, the white cards are a little faster. Uh, so if Joe has one of those, it's just a very clean answer. You see Joe looking through the deck. He sees that uh, there's a reanimated hand and an Entomb and another Faithless Looting. <laughs> uh, good old archetype of endurance. So uh, Did we see one of those just flash by? Yeah, so for those at home wondering what that does, it is a Born of the Gods Uncommon. It's a 6-5 for 8 mana in green. And the text on the card is, Creatures you control have hexproof. Creatures your opponents control lose hexproof. Essentially, it's a way in these matchups where your opponent has tons of answers to uh, Well, this is, this is a great hand for Joe here with the Flusterstorm. And plenty of spells uh, have been cast this turn. See, we're speeding things up here a little bit as pairings for round 6 are getting posted behind us. Well, this is a speedy magic. I mean, the Zeg wins on turn one often enough. <laughs> this is a faithless looting being resolved. Yeah. So reanimate. You know this fluster storm, but yeah. <laughs> Joe, Joe draw that, drew that brainstorm where he gives plus one storm and allows this reanimate to get countered. That was a great pickup by Joe, wow. actually. It's perfect. It sculpts your hand so that you can get rid of like a lot of the land flood that you had, and it allows your Fluster Storm to work. Even had the fetch land there. Oh, but Animate Deck works. <laughs> so he followed up his Reanimate with Animate Dead. Not sure what color name, but if Joe just passes without doing something, I'm going to believe it's blue. Oh, nope. okay. Named white, then. Yep. Now uh, there's Jace. Bounces Iona. Which is the worst place it could possibly be, is in Julian's hand. Definitely, and it, it, I'm actually surprised that Julian didn't name blue, just because Julian knows that Joe has access to Jason the Mind Sculptor. So, I mean, you could name you didn't you could name white like Julian did, but the thing is, you're already losing to a card that Joe already has access to. So I think there, uh, yeah, it would have been better to just play uh, name blue, and Julian would have taken down this game probably. Wow. So. Now Joe is in plus mode on Jace. He said, yeah, you can keep a Cabal Therapy on top of your deck or whatever that was. The, the Wizard Cavern of Souls. It's for those blue grindy matchups. <laughs> There's Vendillion Click. Says you can have both of those. Cavern of Souls is some greedy card. <laughs> you're playing double blue, double white, and then you're playing Cavern of Souls on top of this? Yeah. Wow, that is... I mean, that is some greed. All right, Snapcaster Mage, Flusterstorm. And it looks like... Oh, th those are a lot of... That's a lot Joe of Joe has this, yeah. Joe has this game pretty well in hand there. Yeah, I like the little, like, at the end, bounce your Snapcaster, so it gives you an additional counter spell. That was a pretty... That was, like, good recognition. Yeah, Jul Julian could have won that game maybe by naming blue, and, yeah. Yeah, cer certainly, certainly seems like uh, everything that was coming out of, uh, out of Joe's deck. What was blue? Uh, we've got more magic coming up for you. Duke of Palooza is going to continue. Don't go anywhere right after these messages.